Is cinema dying? It depends on who you ask, but there's one thing that almost everyone agrees on, things are changing. I mean, things have been changing in the industry over the last decade, but the rate of change just accelerated in the past few years. Franchise films went from being the occasional temple features to the dominant offering in theaters, as big media companies discovered that projects attached to already established entities were far more financially successful than original ideas, a flood of remakes, sequels, reboots, and franchises flooded into theaters. Meanwhile, as ticket sales trended down, online streaming became dominant, Netflix rose to prominence. And while it begrudgingly gave in and crossed over into traditional distribution, releasing some of its films in theaters so it could qualify for Academy Awards, every other major studio or media company frantically and desperately crossed over into streaming distribution racing to release their own streaming services. A company that used to just make computers and iPods now began producing Rousseau Brothers movies and Spielberg and J.J. Abrams television. The line between TV and film has also been blurring for a while, with some films starting to look more like TV, long stories with reoccurring characters drawn out over multiple episodes, and many TV shows starting to look more like films broken into smaller pieces. The way we consume media has changed dramatically. There used to be the cinema and your television as ways you could watch something, but now there are theaters, TVs, tablets, computers, and phones. In the midst of all this change, the pandemic hits. Theaters shut down, the big money makers for many companies were essentially halted. Meanwhile, Netflix continued business as usual and exceeded growth expectations in 2020. Late in the year after the one film Warner Brothers dared to release in theaters failed to bring in numbers, the studio announced that they'd release films in theaters and on their streaming service HBO Max simultaneously throughout 2021, a move that for better or worse will likely have historical impact on the film industry, and one that seriously upset filmmakers like Denis Villeneuve and ultimately led to Christopher Nolan breaking off his long-term relationship with the studio. In the midst of all of this sits Martin Scorsese, a 78-year-old director, someone who's been alive for half of cinema's short history as an art form. He's directed 24 feature films, almost as many documentaries, and in the process, he hasn't resisted technological progress in his own work, embracing digital cameras, CGI, producing television, and releasing his latest film on Netflix. What streaming means and how that's going to define a new form of cinema, I'm not sure. He's not someone you could call a Luddite or unwilling to change. I think it's uh, not just an evolving of cinema, but it's a revolution. And yet from his perspective, something he loves dearly, the thing Martin Scorsese calls cinema, looks to be in danger of extinction. But I'm also concerned. I'm almost very concerned. Is he right? This video is sponsored by Mubi. Sign up at mubi.com slash Thomas Flight for 30 days of free access to hand-curated cinema. I recently watched Fellini's Eight and a Half. It's a marvelous film with a camera that drifts through dreamlike scenes and symbolic imagery. I mean, just look at how the perspective of this shot drifts from first person to third person without cutting. Perhaps it was this very shot that inspired Scorsese to do a similar maneuver in The Departed decades later. It's a film where the telling of its story is inseparable from its use of camera movement, editing, and staging, the visual language of film. And I can imagine just how exciting it would have been to walk into a theater in 1963 and see this for the first time on the big screen, not knowing you and everyone packed into the theater were about to watch what would become one of the most influential art house films in history, and the conversations that must have happened afterwards about what it possibly could have meant. That excitement is what Martin Scorsese describes in his new essay for Harper's Magazine, an essay that continues to expand on his concern that the cinema he's known and loved is facing threat of extinction. He's been talking about this for a while, stirring up controversy by saying that superhero films It's not cinema, it's something else. Something closer to theme park rides. But in his new essay, he expounds further, talking about how the dynamics of streaming services are changing the way we consume and think about film. 
But to know if Scorsese is right about cinema dying, we have to first understand what cinema is, at least the way he's defining it. Marty, what did you do? What did he say first? So we all yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 There's going to be a lot of layers here, so hang on. I'm going to try to break it down as clearly as I can, because underneath all of this is not just one man's opinion about going to the movies, but a much broader discussion about an art form, its impact on our culture, how it's changing, and its future. And recently, The Joker was inspired by your cinema, I know. by your movies. But Do you also consider it as a theme park movie? I don't know about that. I know the film very well, and I know Todd very well. My producer, Emma Tillinger-Koskoff, produced it. Yeah, yeah. So um, it's an interesting question. A little over a year ago, I made a video attempting to illustrate visually what I think Scorsese means by cinema. He's not saying cinema is better than superhero films just that cinema is a specific art form and that while Marvel type films may represent a new art form that takes talent and skill to make and that there's nothing wrong with enjoying, it's still something distinct from cinema. It's a distinction that when you make it, no matter how clearly you say it isn't a judgment of quality, fans of both Marvel and other big franchise films tend to take offense at. But it's also a distinction that's tricky to articulate. From the first shot, you know, you know when there's an author there, and you know when it's personal, and you know, it, you can feel it, you can yeah. feel it come through yeah, that's what has every to be moment, uh -huh. every shot, uh -huh. every, and the actors, and every piece of it, and it, and it just doesn't miss you. And I don't know that I can explain it better than that, but you just know it when you see it. In many ways, it's more easily shown than said, which is what I was trying to do with that video. But it's not just a separation between drama and action films. I think the way Scorsese is defining it has to do with intent and use of film form in a specific way, helpful in understanding exactly what Scorsese is concerned with and why he doesn't see superhero films as cinema is Joker. film that in many ways stands on the shoulders of and channels Scorsese's own work. A movie that Scorsese was even in talks to direct, but that he ultimately passed on. I know the script very well, so that it has it's really energy and incredible the Joaquin and all that sort of thing. So you have a remarkable work, but uh, for me, ultimately, I don't know if I, if I make the, uh, uh, how should I say, the next step, which is to this character developing into a comic book character. He makes concessions that Joker stands apart from most superhero films, but for him, some kind of line is still crossed by associating the film with a comic book character. It develops into an abstraction. That doesn't mean it's bad art. It could be, but it's not for me. That changes the film in some way for him. Understanding why is crucial to understanding his concerns as a whole. If we look at the top 50 grossing films in the box office over the last decade, there are only three movies that aren't a remake, reboot, or part of some larger franchise or series. These three movies are Zootopia, The Secret Life of Pets, and Bohemian Rhapsody. The other 47 movies on this list aren't contained self-sufficient individual stories, but part of million or billion dollar entertainment enterprises, including extensive merchandising, related products, and even theme parks. Let me introduce you to Avengers Campus, coming to Disney California Adventure Park. This rendering shows some of the experiences, attractions, and surprises we're super hyped for. Because I saw this happening in the early 70s in Hollywood, where heads of studios were talking about really wanting to have, in the industry, uh, a Disney World. For Scorsese, I think the connection a film has to this larger commercial enterprise changes it at its core. Tour the studio, it's like a theme park ride. Well, why not put a film in there? Why not make the film part of that experience? And I agree, you can't really untangle these movies from their place in a massive corporate enterprise. We had a really hard time getting that film made, which seems insane today. Now, seeing how well the movie's done, we spent a year at Warner Brothers and I saw emails back and forth, literally where they said, does he realize, meaning me, does he realize we sell Joker pajamas at Target? <laughs> and so- Is that true? It's very, yeah, well. what you're saying, where, I don't know, I go, I, do, doesn't the movies come first, the pajamas come second? <laughs> no. Like, are the pajamas yeah. dictating no. the movies? No, We might be tilting this, the, the, the scales away from that creative viewing experience and away from 
away from movies as an art form. I can't stress this enough. Before you come in with your angry comments about how I hate Marvel, I'm no fun, I'm pretentious or whatever, Scorsese and I are not saying that these things should not be made. The sense of theme park has always been there. It's always been, it's not bad. Mm. We used to love to go to amusement parks, you know, but now in an amusement park, you have the film. By all means, Disney and Warner Brothers should keep cranking out big budget superhero films, and you may continue to go watch them and enjoy them, and I'm not looking down on anyone for it. What I am saying, and what I think Scorsese cares about, is that in the midst of all of this, there's a place for artistic narratives that aren't tied to larger corporate financial enterprise that there's a value in telling stories that stand alone. In his Harper's essay, instead of trying to define cinema by talking about what it isn't, Scorsese instead tries to define the form by holding up a defining example. He says, you can say a lot of things about Fellini's movies, but here's one thing that is incontestable. They are cinema. Fellini's work goes a long way towards defining the art form. So when Scorsese says cinema, he's talking about a certain kind of movie and an approach to movie making. But there's another complicating factor in his definition. Scorsese also is talking about the specific experience of seeing a film in a theater. For Scorsese, the way a film is consumed and is meant to be consumed is part of what defines it as cinema. If I can try to summarize what I think Scorsese's definition of cinema is, it's a type of experience of leaving your house to go to a place where you watch a film with other people. And the film you watch is not just part of a commercial enterprise produced by a massive corporation and based around existing characters and material, but a unique individual story that is crafted and presented with special care to film language, tradition, and form. I completely agree with him that that experience is a unique and distinct thing. And while I'm not elitist about it and wouldn't say that the theater is the only valid viewing experience for movies or that you're not really watching a film if you watch it at home or watch it on your phone, I think there is definitely something distinct about watching a film in a theater. It has a communal aspect. You can't pause the film. The sound quality and image quality are hopefully better, louder, and bigger, and I'm completely open to the argument that those differences aren't really that big of a deal, but I personally think these differences in presentation do affect how you perceive a film and its story. But here's the thing. That thing Scorsese is talking about, even if it is distinct, is cinema really the right word for it? Here I'm not really sure. On one hand, I think using the term and labeling Marvel films not cinema probably makes Scorsese's point a little more controversial than it needs to be, making it sound like he's making a quality judgment rather than a descriptive one. But on the other hand, what else would you call it? What better word is there to make this distinction? I'm not sure. But no matter what you label it, the experience I described above, the one Scorsese labels cinema, that specific thing does seem to be dying, or at least significantly diminishing in cultural influence. But this is where I'm conflicted. Cinema, especially as it involves the communal, theatrical experience, might be at the beginning of a slow death. But if you're interested in the art of moving images and the rich, unique stories being told with them, apart from that communal theatrical experience, it's maybe the best time to be alive. For anyone who is interested in the art form of cinema and film history, there's now, for most people, actually the possibility of access to an unparalleled selection of films and film history. In the era Scorsese came up in, when he was watching Eight and a Half, it was before home video was even widely available. At that time, you were reliant on theaters in your city or town to find and curate films for you. And unless you had the extravagant resources to collect 35mm film prints or access to a library of prints, much of film history would have been completely inaccessible to you. These days, with a subscription to a few streaming services, you can have access to more great cinema than you would ever have time to conceivably watch. And in a way, it's the same technology that is killing cinema that's making this possible. You may not be able to have as many experiences in theaters in the same way Scorsese did, and that's certainly sad, but the trade-off so far has meant unparalleled access to a world of cinema for those who are interested, but there are also downsides to this new availability. The cultural influence of moving image entertainment as a whole, whether it's movies, TV, YouTube videos, or TikToks, 
is at an all-time high, and in a way, the real struggle for Scorsese's cinema is not even to differentiate itself from Marvel-type films, it's to even be able to differentiate itself from any kind of moving image entertainment in this vast world of content. We are surrounded by a torrent of moving images. It is inescapably part of our cultural language. Fellini's Eight and a Half, a four-hour movie that wasn't shown in theaters, a TV show that's 90 minutes in length, a web series that's now a TV show, a new indie film, a blockbuster release, and for that matter, a video of your friend on vacation or me talking to you right now all get lumped together into a giant bin we call content. Film critic Matt zoller Seitz says in an article addressing this issue, content refers to a piece of entertainment that can be delivered any number of ways, and that's defined less by its story, characters, source material, or presentational medium, cinema or TV, than by its brand identity, Marvel, its corporate parentage, Disney, and its ability to get hundreds of millions of people talking about it all at once. To distill all moving images down to content, I think is to value them only for what they provide to the companies that serve them to us. Something to be traded for subscription dollars or a way to grab your attention to trade it for advertising dollars. Yeah, movie goers are better defined today as movie watchers. You know, a lot of that movie watching now mostly happens at home. That's just the way it is, okay. I think treating everything as content divorces the viewer from the person creating the content and what they have to say. Hence, I feel it's kind of becoming more and more uh, tailored towards a consumer experience because movies are, they're slotted into consumer categories before they're even given a chance to breathe. It turns the viewer from someone participating in an artistic expression to just a passive consumer of entertainment or a product. If I really wanted to lose viewers at this point, I'd put up a big title that says the importance of visual literacy. But I'm not going to do that because I want people to keep watching and I know that as boring and nerdy as some of this stuff sounds, if you're a fan of movies, want to be a filmmaker, a storyteller, a critic, or you're just somebody who watches a lot of stuff, this is important. In this giant bin of content, it's easy for the distinguishing artistic approaches to each work or even medium to get lost. You might not see these distinctions as important, but the traditions of how images are manipulated, what we call film form, are the foundation of an incredibly important and influential visual grammar that impacts us every day as a part of everything we watch and yet we barely acknowledge its existence. We teach literacy, grammar, and spelling in school, but while the average person spends more time watching moving images than reading or writing, the idea of visual literacy as something that's worth even recognizing the existence of, much less teaching, is often scoffed at and ridiculed as pretentious. And if you think I'm being pretentious, exclusionary, elitist, or even just boring, just keep in mind I'm not saying anything that limits you from enjoying entertainment. All I'm doing is inviting you to gain a better understanding of the visual language that makes up the entertainment you watch, which I believe will make your life richer and better and even increase your appreciation of that entertainment giving you a better understanding of the stories you're consuming. But to be able to study, teach, and learn that language, I think we need to preserve the experience of cinema. You know, we can't have a future of our art form without knowing its past. Even among fans of film, few use the opportunity to really dig into this rich medium and its history because the great stuff just sits in one giant bin, indistinguishable from everything else we call content. Anybody can upload their music to iTunes or maybe even Spotify these, these days. It doesn't really matter because if people don't know how to find you, yeah. it doesn't yeah, matter yeah, how true, yeah. Yeah. wide it is. The great cinema, the great TV, even the great YouTube videos, the ones that won't just kill a couple hours for you, but will shape the way you see the world, challenge your preconceptions, and show you new experiences, get lost in the flood of content that gets suggested to you simply because an algorithm knows it will grab and hold your attention or because it's what's most suitable for advertising. Like those 47 out of the 50 top grossing films from the last decade, much of what is dominant on streaming platforms is defined by its commercial economic viability. And that's not a great environment to promote and foster the creation of good art. 
The reason remakes, reboots, and sequels are more commercially viable is because they're a safe bet. Financiers know that these things have a built-in audience who will pay to see them. What is safe financially is what's worked in the past and what has been done before. But good art is something that takes risks, challenges norms, and develops the medium. It's rarely a safe bet. And if we create a landscape that only promotes and encourages content that is a safe bet, we'll cut ourselves off from access to new, interesting art that is innovative and original. Where things go from here, with theaters, with the industry, I don't know. Streaming services could lead to increasingly mediocre and safe content, or they could potentially fund a revival of unique art, sparking new waves and movements. And there's been evidence to indicate both of these things, and maybe they'll both happen simultaneously. Cinema might fade out of the theaters, with massive franchises being the only thing that can still survive there, or maybe it'll be relegated to art house movie theaters. But the cinema of unique, artistic, individual stories is still out there and accessible if you know where to look. I know the business has changed, and everything changes all the time. Impermanence, that's what it's about. It's wide open though now. You can watch everything, anytime, anywhere, and it puts a burden on you, on the viewer. If it is preserved, it will be because people like you are willing to see its value and seek it out. What is the value of cinema? Cinema, while it can be entertaining, won't just entertain you for two hours. It will offer you new perspectives, show you the world, give you a glimpse of the future or the past, force you to examine yourself, to contemplate life, and reshape the way you see all the other moving images that surround you. Every individual filmmaker amounts to more than the number of awards they've won or the amount of monies the pictures make. And every individual viewer, it's you, amounts to more, much more than the data that has been collected about them, huh? One of the solutions that Scorsese proposes to the issues with streaming services is a heavier focus on curation. And he specifically name drops some streaming services that do curation well. One of them is Mubi, my sponsor for this video. Mubi's curation really is its selling point. I've discovered so much great cinema through Mubi that I truly wouldn't have found if it hadn't been for my Mubi subscription. They handpick a new film every day and they offer an explanation for why it's worth your time. It was an experimental short film that I randomly stumbled across on Mubi that inspired me to make an experimental short film last year. While Scorsese holds Fellini up as a defining example of cinema, some Someone else I'd personally choose as a defining example is Andrei Tarkovsky, and right now on Mubi in the US you can watch The Sacrifice and his film Nostalgia. When you sign up at Mubi.com slash Thomas Flight you'll get an extended 30 day free trial. I recommend you just go check it out and start watching something that looks interesting to you and it will be an interesting experience because another human hand chose that film because they thought it was worth watching. Sign up at Mubi.com slash Thomas Flight to support my channel channel, movie, and cinema all at once.